Oh, well, now announces it. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, June General Club meeting for Mike and Key. Uh, we've got a, uh, we'll do our presentation first here at 10 o'clock uh, with Wayne, uh, N6NB, and then we'll take a break. Uh, we'll stop the recording, we'll take a break, about a five minute break, and then we'll start the general business and uh, vote in uh, our new candidates and so on. So with that said, again, if you, uh, one last call for naming, uh, please take a look in the chat window and uh, rename yourself accordingly. It helps us with attendance and keeping things uh, moving along. So I'm going to do a announcement here. Let's see. All right. So <clears throat> the presentation this morning is by uh, Wayne Overbeck, N6NB. Uh, Wayne was first licensed in 1957 and has specialized in VHF and UHF amateur radio contests especially on uh, mountaintops and in vehicles where RF safety is a major concern. He holds a PhD and a JD degree degrees and spent most of his career as a university professor. He first worked on RF safety issues while he was on the legal staff of the National Association of Broadcasters in the early 1980s. He worked on that subject again as an ARRL vice director from 1984 to 1992 and, and accompanied oh. scientists from the FCC and EPA uh, when they did measurements on the R of the RF fields of, at amateur radio stations uh, in 1990. In 1996, when the FCC first required some radio amateurs to, to evaluate the RF safety of their operations, Wayne wrote a basic computer program to do the evaluations. It was received by the FCC staff for accuracy, excuse me, reviewed. The Lake Washington online calculator is based on this program. The RF safety page at n6nb.com has both the basic program and a longer article about the topic. So uh, Wayne, uh, why don't you take it away and you should be able to go ahead and screen share. And I will get everyone muted once uh, Wayne, I'm gonna mute everyone now and then Wayne, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, Am I unmuted? Yeah. Hold on just a sec. Okay, Wayne, go ahead. Wayne, go ahead and unmute yourself. Everybody else is muted. Hey, I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. We can hear you. Go oh, ahead, sir. Hello. Now, what do I do? Yeah, your your audio is still pretty low, so I don't know if there's something again you can kind of do to help that. We'll we'll try and turn our volume up, but I can't oh, adjust I, uh, Zoom. I, yeah, this the volume has been low on this. Okay, I have to speak up, okay. and I have to get. Um, my PowerPoint show on the screen. Let's see, share video. You have to tell them you're still disabled. Okay, apparently I'm still disabled. Okay, give me just a sec. <clears throat> Hmm. Okay, I'm going to turn to my uh, <laughs> fellow club members. I'm not seeing a. Hold on. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Uh, give that a try now, Wayne. Okay. Sure. There you go. Okay. We can see your presentation. F5. Okay. Oh, hello, I'm here. Now this is gonna work like a real computer. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just start in here. Um, my story is about, uh, well, the FCC adopted new rules recently 
uh, that require most radio amateurs uh, to do a routine evaluation of their station for RF safety. And uh, so that's what I was asked to talk about. Now, let's see here. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can do this. One way, and probably the best way in terms of accuracy, is to do a field measurement. And these days, there are a lot of ways you can do that. There are imported uh, field strength meters that are calibrated uh, the way the FCC wants the calibration, uh, which is going to be milliwatts per square centimeter or microwatts per square centimeter. Now, uh, of these four, I'm going to use my mouse to point. Uh, the bottom meter I'm showing you here is a general microwave uh, radio. It's called a radiation hazard monitor, RAHAM for short. Uh, it's a professional meter. It's more or less accurate from below the broadcast band to 26 gigahertz. That's a very broad banded thing, uh, widely used in industry. It's been around for some years. And I found one on eBay a while back. And I had used one before uh, at my office at Cal State Fullerton, uh, the physics department across campus had a radiation safety office and they had one of these meters and I had been able to borrow it and go out and make field, field measurements and I knew how accurate and how good these things were. So when I found one on eBay, I bought it. Now, if you want to spend $300 or even less, you can buy one imported that does much the same thing, but not over as wide a bandwidth. Uh, the one the second one up that I'm pointing at now uh, cost me $320 on Amazon. It covers 100 megahertz to 3,500 megahertz, which covers a lot of things, but not, of course, the HF amateur band, which is important to us. Next one up uh, goes from 10 megahertz to 8 gigahertz. That's a lot better. That one I just bought for 320 on Amazon. Now the cute little one, the orange one, let's see, it goes from 50 megahertz to three and a half gigahertz. Uh, that's useful for uh, VHF and up at $150 for that one. I think a very good way to do an evaluation, if you happen to have something like this or can find it somewhere, is to actually go out and measure. Short of that, uh, the easiest way to do it is with a computer program. Now, in your area, you have probably the nation's leading club uh, online calculator, the Lake Washington Ham Club. Uh, they, I, I wrote this program 25 years ago, got the SEC to review it for accuracy, and I've had it online as a public domain program ever since. A number of people have taken it, which they're welcome to do, and made it into online calculators. But this is my version, which is on my website. It's a basic program. You enter data, you get the results, you can print out the results and save them. So you have this, um, you know, so you have this record of what you've done. And I'm gonna show you that in a few minutes. But first, let me show you how I got involved in this. I mean, what's a guy sitting in Southern California doing all involved with the FCC in this. Well, how I got involved was this. Uh, as a professor, one of the things I did in the summer uh, was to work at the National Association of Broadcasters uh, near DuPont Circle in Washington, DC. My office was up near the top up here in the legal department uh, at the NAB. And uh, because I was a member of the bar, I was able to practice law there, even though normally I taught law, I didn't practice it. Um, and I wrote a textbook that went through 20 editions. So I was very involved in that. But several summers, I worked at the NAB and I learned a lot. I learned how uh, professionals at a trade association work with the FCC. Uh, that was a real experience. And, and I came out of that knowing some of the people at the FCC and uh, being in a position that 
where when I went back uh, as a ham, as an elected officer of the American Radio Relay League, uh, I, I kind of knew where to start. So where I started, we started with a bit of a crisis. This newspaper article appeared in, oh, about 100 newspapers. It was an Associated Press story out of Tacoma, Washington, about a scientist. And now in the last year with the pandemic, we've heard a lot about epidemiologists. These are guys and gals who study health patterns of large groups of people. And this guy, Dr. Sam Millen, at the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, had decided to study ham radio operators for cancer rate. How he got into that is he was doing work with electrical workers, people who were full-time electrical workers in various industries. And he started seeing that they had higher than normal rates of certain cancers, um, multiple myeloma, myeloma leukemia, um, some types of lymphoma, and prostate cancer. So he wondered about ham operators. And he, well, the, the backstory here, and this is unfortunate, uh, he went to the league and he said, I want to do a study and I want your cooperation. And they circled the wagons. They, the staff said, no, we're not going to talk to you. Which, of course, left Dr. Millam convinced they were hiding something. I mean, this is, I, I knew from my time at the NAB, this is not how you deal with a scientist who has an idea for a research project. Well, Dr. Millam did the research anyway without the league's cooperation. What he did is he used silent key data. Uh, he found out that QST magazine publishes a list of people who have passed on. Uh, almost every month they publish such a list. So he gathered up five years of these lists, collected all the names of hams who had passed from the QST silent key data. He, he came up with the names of all the hams who had uh, passed in Washington state and in California and he got, oh, 2,500 hams. Um, and he went, then he went and researched their cause of death from death certificates. And what he found was they had statistically significant excess mortality from these several kinds of cancer. Now, when we actually talked to him, when I talked to him, uh, he was very civil and, and he was a scientist looking for the truth. And what he said was, well, I really think what I'm seeing is occupational exposure. He says, I think a disproportionate number of these people work in occupations where they're around strong electric fields. I don't think it's their ham radio that's the problem. I think that's just a coincidence. And in any case, an epidemiologist doesn't prove causation, it's correlation that ham operators, he found in his group, his population he studied, had a um, somewhat higher than normal rate of certain cancers. Okay, so here we go. This is in many newspapers. Uh, the league, I will tell you, there were board meetings where there was very serious discussion about this. The league had a bioeffects committee. Uh, they had a committee uh, of people who uh, were supposed to advise the board on the biological effects of amateur radio. Well, the chairman of that committee set out to discredit Dr. Millen, set out to destroy his reputation. He started looking for people who would say bad things about him. And a lot of the rest of us said, no, that's not the way you handle this at all. Well, we were able to persuade the president of the league and the majority of the board uh, to, the, to reconstitute the committee and to put people on it who, in several cases, had potent medical backgrounds. Uh, I was the only lawyer on the committee. I, I was working with uh, four very, very good lawyers, including a guy who was a 
a medical researcher. He'd been at UCLA for years and then at the Loma Linda Medical School. And he had published over 400 journal articles about the biological effects of electro electromagnetic energy. This guy was one of the world's true experts. Well, we got this committee together and we were able to do some things. First of all, uh, we got the board level Biofix committee involved. We got on the committee and we, and we went to work. First of all, our chairman, uh, Dr. Ivan Schulman, a cancer surgeon, uh, did an, an article that was an explanation of what Dr. Schulman had done. It, it discussed, it analyzed his study in a professional way, not looking to tear it apart, but just looking to explain it objectively. This article appeared in QSD in October of 89. And it went a long way toward convincing uh, Dr. Millen that we were not bad guys. The next year, he agreed to speak at an amateur radio Southwestern uh, Division convention. Uh, he was on a panel there. We were very glad to have him to explain what he did and how he did it. And he did find excess mortality from some cancers among hands. I mean, he did. That was what he found. We, we did, uh, after that initial article, our committee was able to do one more in QST. We did this article, which I wrote, which was about uh, some of what was known medically about electromagnetic fields. And this was 30 years ago now, but we knew a lot about it. Uh, we knew that, uh, that certain electromagnetic fields uh, did interact with the immune system. Uh, they, electromagnetic fields we knew interfered with the work of T lymphocytes. We knew that there were uh, electromagnetic fields. EMFs did things like interfering with circadian rhythms. There were a whole litany of health effects that we knew were out there at low levels. Uh, now, if you if you expose somebody to a high enough level of RF, you're, you're gonna have thermal effects. You're gonna have body heating. That can lead to blindness. It can lead to sterility, all kinds of bad things. That's been known since World War II. But now what we're looking at is fields that are too weak to cause body heating, but they still have some biological effects. Anyway, we explained some of that in two articles. Now, about this time, uh, the FCC and the EPA decide they need to know more about what hams are doing. And in 1990, they proposed to uh, launch a field survey that they were going to do of ham stations. And I already knew the guy at the FCC who was the chief of that unit, a guy named Dr. Bob Cleveland a scientist, a, a very good guy. And he brought his friend, Ed Manipoli from the Environmental Protection Agency and, and his assistant, a woman named Tony West into the picture. And they, uh, I agreed to, I offered to go with them. I said, I will line up stations, volunteers, hams who agree to let you measure their stations, come in, poke around. The only thing I ask is that this is just a science. This is information gathering. Uh, we're not going to do any prosecutions. So with that understanding, we went out and visited a bunch of ham stations. I went along and these people went, went, went with me. Now here, here's their truck. This is 30 years ago now. Don't expect modern fashion. Don't expect modern vehicles. Um, this belongs to the EPA. Part of the backstory was Bob Cleveland was at the FCC in Washington, but Ed Manipoli had an EPA unit in Las Vegas. And he and his colleague, Tony West, drove down to LA from Las Vegas. Bob Cleveland flew in from Washington and we got together and did this field work. And I'll show you what we did, because I think it's interesting. And it led to all the later regulations we've seen. Here's inside the truck. Now, I don't even know what all this equipment is,
but they were capable of doing measurements, fairly sophisticated ones, using equipment like this thing here in the foreground here. This is a probe. You notice it's a ham rotator that they expropriated for this. They've got stepper motors in it, and they've got this thing turning in three axes. So you can look at the three dimensions of an RF field. And they've got this thing out in front of, in this case, it's my ro rover station as it looked 30 years ago. And what I've got is a six meter five element beam. I've got a kilowatt inside, a pair of three 500 Zs. I've got a two meter uh, eight element quaggy up there at the top. Why doesn't it show? Uh, anyway, it, um, it's up top. And I have a kilowatt on two meters. So now I've got this pointing away from their probe and we made measurements. Then I pointed towards their probe and we made measurements. We confirmed a couple of things. One is my antennas had front to back ratio. The other more unfortunate thing is out there where the probe was, there was a very strong field. It was strong enough that the standards were much more lenient in 1990 than they were even a few years later. But even under those standards, it would have been hazardous for humans to be out walking around in front of that antenna while I was transmitting. Uh, okay, duly noted, that was one of the things they flagged. Now, let me go on and show you some. Oh, here's the probe. And I mean, it, it, it's set up so that it's, a, it's not a ham in, it's, it looks like one but inside it has stepper motors. Okay, now we're doing, and by the way, the fashions are 30 years old. Please don't judge anybody by their fashions. But this one was, an, I remember this one very well. Uh, I volunteered to have them measure my two meter mobile. Now what I've got here is a hatchback, a 32 or 33 year old hatchback. We've got a whip antenna a 19 inch hip whip here. Inside I've got a two meter FM transceiver and a brick. I've got hundred watts and now we're gonna measure. And remember the thing about this is you can park where there are people. People can be nearby. So what happens here, Tony West, uh, her job is to take notes while Bob Cleveland and Ed Mattably, who you'll see in a minute, um, make measurements. And they, they get into this field. I mean, I put a rubber band around the mic on my mobile rig, so it's key down. And he's measuring the field. And first thing he says, Tony's standing right next to him. He says, Tony, we're in a strong field. I think you should sit down um, and get, a, get as far away from it as you can and still do your job. So she sits down and takes notes now, one thing about RF fields, there's this inverse square rule. If Tony West is standing right next to Bob Cleveland and her head is three feet, okay, from this antenna, the field strength is gonna be a certain amount. When she moves back, sits down, and now her head is say eight feet from the antenna, okay? What's gonna happen to the field strength? Well, let's make it simple. I made it too complicated. She goes from three feet from the antenna to six feet from the antenna. What's going to happen to the field strength? It's going to go down fourfold. So you, you double the distance, you get a fourfold decrease in field strength. So the strategy always, when you've got an R field and it's a strong field, get away from it. That is the name of the game, inverse square law. <clears throat> All right, we continue on. Now, okay, here's this Rahab meter. Uh, not the same, this is the one I borrowed 30 years ago from my employer, Cal State Fullerton. I later found one of my own that I, I bought on eBay. <clears throat> here's what it's reading. It's reading on the scale we've got here. It's reading two milliwatts per square centimeter at this distance from this antenna. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, well there's no 
<clears throat> there's no, okay, there's a standard that applies to everyone, including hams, but there's no requirement that you find out you meet the standard, not yet anyway. <clears throat> so we know this is way over the standard, but hams are not required to do an evaluation and know if they're over the standard. But this installation is. <clears throat> I came away from this knowing, okay, you don't transmit when there are people standing around your vehicle uh, in the near field of your antenna. It's just not, not a nice thing to do. So now we're at a much different kind of a station. This is the ham, uh, the station of a ham. See the power back there? This guy has a 70 foot crank up tower. He's got a big antenna on top of it. <coughs> and Ed Mattifully of the EPA and Bob Cleveland of the FCC are measuring on his deck. Nothing. When the antenna is way up in the air, the inverse square law makes sure that the fields where there are people are very, very low. Uh, the FCC and EPA people determined that in every case, if you get an antenna way up on a tower, it's pretty safe. It's not a health hazard. <coughs> that was their major finding. Uh, if they had their druthers, every ham would have a 70 foot tower because it's just safer. Get the antenna away from people. Here's Ed Mattably measuring another in front of his house. He's out there looking at ground reflection. You see the beam antenna. Whoop, did I go back? Okay, here's his beam antenna and he's at ground level. <coughs> Don't underestimate ground reflections. They're there, but it's not a problem. This kind of an installation, I would not worry about for one second. Now here's one that is a little dicey. It's a ground mounted vertical. And with great precision, this guy is a scientist. He's got a tape measure and he's making measurements of the field strength at various distances from this. This is the radiating element. Uh, it's, it's like a high gain high tower or something. <clears throat> you know, it's got, it's got the counterpoise, the radials, and he's measuring with his probe he knows a certain distance. See, then he's gonna step back further and he's gotta get a whole series of readings of what the field strength is near this high tower with the ham transmitting. And he did ask the ham to turn on his amp so he could get the worst case reading. And the conclusion was that you don't wanna be close to the base of something like that while it's being, well, a signal is being transmitted. Uh, you want to stay away. Again, distance is your friend. <clears throat> and he learned that. Sorry about my voice. It's a little early in the morning for me. Now, here's one that is one of the most telling things of all. We had a ham, and I, I deliberately sought out someone like this because I wanted the FCC to measure this. When a ham uh, lives in a condo, a townhouse. That's what this is. And he wants to be on the air. What's he going to do? Well, the HOA says no antennas, right? Well, guess what the ham is going to do? He's going to hide an antenna in a tree or in the attic. Okay. Now what? Well, and he, oh, and this guy happened to have uh, the FCC looked the other way. This guy had a Henry 3K amplifier. <clears throat> the thing put out, if the truth be told, more than the legal limit. In a condo with a hidden antenna in a tree and an antenna in the attic. So they went out and measured these things. And you know what they're going to find. They're going to find strong RF fields where the people around have no idea they're in an RF field because the antenna is hidden, right? Then they went up and with the ham's permission, they poked around in his master bedroom. And this, uh, the FCC guy, Bob Cleveland was, was stunned when he saw this one. 
because on the edge of the master, uh, the king size bed in the master bedroom, the field was way over uh, the then standard. And the standard now is stricter than it was then. Uh, so we had, we had a guy with, an, uh, with a dipole in the attic, uh, driving it with a, with a Henry 3K and five feet below the dipole in the master bedroom, the field was very strong. And, and then Bob Cleveland says, what's on the other side of this wall? And he says, oh, somebody else's unit. Oh, and the dipole goes how far? So we're looking at an exposure of unknowing neighbors uh, in a, you know, to a, to a degree that's, that does violate the standards. <clears throat> One of the things the FCC and EPA came away with is, you know, we're going to have to have some rules that expressly apply to hams to tell them that if you're going to run high power in a condo, you've got to find a way to get the antennas away from people. Now, here's one of the worst of all. This is a later model of my rover. I'm obviously not in Southern California. I'm actually in Pennsylvania on a road. And I have kilowatts on six meters, two meters, 220, 432, lower power on other bands. And I've got this thing out and there, there are no people here now, but if I did have people nearby, they would be in a strong field. Uh, this is pretty much a worst case scenario. If you're gonna rove with high power, don't do it when people are near you. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, let's quickly move through some history. The FCC went back after the study. Oh, they published their study in a refereed scholarly journal. Uh, they published their study of what they found at ham stations. Uh, and it was, they didn't identify any of the stations, but they described what they found. Uh, and they, they published that in 1991. In, at a conference, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1992, they adopted the ANSI. IEEE had recommended, and the American National Standards Institute had adopted a new standard. And the new standard was five times stricter for public exposure than the old standard, which was intended for workplaces. We called it an uncontrolled environment standard and in a workplace, a controlled environment standard where everybody knows the fields they're in, it's been studied. <clears throat> but now bear in mind, this new standard is still only based on thermal effects. It's based on body heating. If you don't have body heating, the standard says there's no hazard. <clears throat> and that's, that's been open to challenge. In 96, the FCC uh, in a new proceeding announced effective in two years that they would remove the categorical exemption for amateur radio stations, which meant unless you were exempted for low power being mobile or using handheld equipment, those were still exempt. Other than that, uh, you were still, you were responsible to do a routine evaluation. You could do it by looking at a table in an FCC bulletin. You could do it with a computer program. You could do it with field measurements, <clears throat> but you had to do it in some way. Okay, that was 96 effective in 98. The categorical exemption uh, was cut way back. Many hams uh, and then test questions were added to the exams to make hams more aware of, of these issues. All right, so this all went on. Fast forward to 2019. The FCC recently removed the exemption for low power mobile and handheld radios. And in, in its place said, we're not gonna have a flat exemption for anything. We're gonna have a formula. And you, you can see if you're exempt by plugging in your power your antenna gain, the distance to anywhere where other people are into a formula. 
And if you're if the numbers are low enough, you're exempt. But if not, you have to do an evaluation. Well, my reaction to that is doing the evaluation is easier than figuring out if you're exempt. So you just do the evaluation. It's very painless, as I'll show you. <clears throat> and and it uh, it's just just it it's something you do and you you do a printout, uh, you save it, you label. Well, it'll be time stamped when it comes out, saying what date and time it was, shows the frequency and the distances involved. So you do that and and you're in pretty good shape. And most hams are not going to have a, an unpleasant surprise. It's really very painless and most hams are really pretty safe. Now, the 2019 FCC order did not change the standard itself. They didn't change the safety standard. It's still based only on thermal effects. The FCC went to some length to explain why they were not adopting a stricter standard for athermal effects. And that was, of course, criticized by uh, scientists around the world. I'll get to that in a minute. But they did not change the standard. They only said, under the same old standard, you have to do a routine evaluation if you have most ham stations. Okay, now we get to the opposition. Uh, this is an, a group of 255 scientists who had published in the fields of EMFs from 44 nations filed a petition with the United Nations asking you, the UN and its members to adopt stricter standards to protect the public better from exposure to EMFs. These scientists, mostly not industry funded, have published more than 2000 peer reviewed journal articles and they've studied all kinds of different things that are uh, potential hazards of electromagnetic fields. There is some science here. And by the way, there, I, I mentioned mostly not industry funded because there's a real, at meetings of scientists, you, you get arguments between scientists who do not accept money from industry and those who do. And of course, those who accept money, grants and such or honorary to go out and speak from industry invariably get different results than the independent scientists. So an issue that I have and this goes way back. Uh, the, the other day, I, I recently watched a document, a PBS documentary about Rachel Carson, who, who wrote Silent Spring. Uh, and of course, she was about pesticides as a carcinogen. And the industry scientists were all over her. She had a bestseller, uh, and she redefined uh, the modern environmental movement. Uh, and we came to know that some pesticides are dangerous. Um, and, you know, every time we've had a new, a new carcinogen come along, uh, we've had this conflict between those who are paid by industry and those who are independent. Uh, Rachel Carson certainly got her share of flack uh, for publishing Silent Spring, but it did redefine what we thought, and we thought DDT was great stuff until Silent Spring. Well, no, that wasn't when we first knew, but it popularized the awareness that that uh, chemicals like DDT were dangerous. Now, uh, the appeal from the 20, 255 scientists, here's a summary, here's what it says. This is on their website, emfscientist.org. Numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMFs affect living organisms at levels well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk with some cancers, not all, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional changes in the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and, ne and then the catch-all, negative impacts on general well-being in humans. Um, you know, 
I, this is controversial. I think they've overstated some of the dangers, but they haven't overstated all of them. Um, this is a problem. Now, okay, the appeal, these scientists didn't have a standard to offer because they don't all agree about what's a safe threshold. I mean, you can get those people in the room, they're gonna have a big argument about what the standard should be for safety. Um, it's, not, it's not like there's a consensus, uh, but the FCC standard uh, is not nearly adequate in their view. Um, and college textbooks have sections about athermal e EMF hazards. This international academic body, the Bioelectromagnetic Society has annual conferences. They address these issues. Uh, it's, it's of concern. Now there is a lot of opposition. First of all, there are government bodies that just don't want to rock the boat. So they're not uh, they're not creating stricter standards. If they did create stricter standards, it would would, court, would cost a fortune. I mean, it would be uh, it would be astronomical what it would cost. Um, now, when it comes to cell phones, and there is now research that in laboratory animals, you put the kinds of RF fields that come from a cell phone uh, and raise rats for a lifetime in those kinds of fields, they are gonna come up with more than the normal amount of certain cancers. And that those studies have been replicated. There are, there are known hazards, but so what are we gonna do? Tell 5 billion, pe 5 billion people to stop using their cell phone? Ain't gonna happen. I use my cell phone all the time. Uh, we know we're taking a chance. Not everyone does. I do. But, you know, this is a very real problem. We can't just shut down the cell phone industry. Now, and by the way, it's the individual phones that are very close to your head that are the danger. If you've got a, if you've got a speaker phone, uh, a Bluetooth thing or something. Now, the Bluetooth is RF as well but it's much lower level and it's much less dangerous. I mean, what, if you're smart, what you do is you don't, as, as much as possible, you don't hold your cell phone right next to your ear. You hold it some distance away, use a Bluetooth device or something. Um, and you know, there's a lot of uproar about 5G. I don't think there's much basis for concern because those transmitting antennas are on poles, uh, they're on rooftops, they're, they're away from people. Uh, when you go out and do measurements, you're, gonna not, you're not gonna find much in the way of EMFs from 5G uh, transmitter sites. What you're gonna find is people holding these things right up to their ear. Remember the inverse square law? If you double the distance, you get one fourth the exposure, that kind of thing. Now, of course, this affects hams. Hams aren't the primary target now, thank heavens, but we do have to be careful. I mean, if you're gonna run a kilowatt in a condo, for goodness sakes, find a way to get the antenna away from people. I mean, that's just one of the things that's a given. Now, the popular media are on this issue. Here are some books. Currents of Death, Paul Brugger's pioneering book. Uh, you see there's another one. And Dr. Sam Millen finally wrote a book. His thing is mostly electric currents. And he thinks the quality of the electricity has a lot to do with cancer risk. He's talking the waveform is the energy a clean sine wave or not. That kind of thing is, is what he's looking at. And this author on the right is accusing the cell phone industry of a cover up. Now, there's no way to get activists more excited than for an industry that look like it's doing a cover up. 
That's how the AWRL Arrow got in trouble with Sam Millen in the first place, by just even looking like they were going to try to hide something. Just a bad idea. Okay, let's do a little more summary. Uh, there have been a number of studies that link power line EMS with childhood leukemia. Uh, a woman, a scientist, uh, won the Darsonville Award of the Bioelectromagnetics Society for demonstrating that in a study that was replicated. Uh, there's been a lot of research on childhood leukemia and certain electromagnetic magnetic fields. And here's the thing, it's not necessarily the strongest fields that are the most dangerous. It's, it's this, most cancers are dose dependent. You know, look, uh, if you spray a field with DDT, the more you use, the worse it's going to be. If you've got asbestos in your ceiling, the more there is, the worse it's going to be. With like every other cigarette smoke, uh, it, you know, the, the rate of cancer and heart disease and other things, it goes up exponentially uh, when you increase the amount of, of smoke that you expose someone to. Uh, those are dose dependent. Well, EMFs are not dose dependent, it turns out. There are low level fields that produce more health effects than higher level fields. So what do we do? Well, basically what we've done worldwide is not do much of anything because we really don't fully understand the problem. Um, however, the World Health Organization has it, its cancer control body has declared EMFs to be a part a possible carcinogen. I mean, that is all out there. And now we have FCC regulation. And I've already said this, uh, the FCC rules are the most recent ANSI standard. And the I'm gonna have a chart in a minute, I'm gonna show you. But it says the uh, RF exposure has to be the least at frequencies from 30 to 300 megahertz. Why is that? Why is the standard strict there? That's because whole body heating is most likely there. All humans, well, human beings have a resonant frequency, okay? Humans are resonant between 30 and 300 megahertz. 30 megahertz, big guys, 300 megahertz, little kids. But humans are resonant and therefore absorb more energy in the 30 to 300 meg range. So you've got this, uh, you've got this chart I'm gonna show you. And the lowest MPA, the, the number, if you have a meter, you need this as a computer program, it'll figure it out for you. But uh, if you have a meter, you need to know what the standard is. And amateurs, the FCC says, you're in a controlled environment where you're gonna have a higher exposure on your own property but it's an uncontrolled environment in public places and on neighbor's property, which means you have to have lower fields. Now, back to the FCC survey, um, they found some, but not many places that were over the standard. Most ham activities are very safe. They adopted, FCC adopted the bulk of the ANSI 1992 standard for applying to all FCC licensees. Um, and the categorical exemption uh, was removed for hams. Okay, low power ham stations were exempt until recently. Other amateurs had to do routine evaluations. And as I said, it can be done several ways. And there are test questions on RF safety on exams. Here's the chart. Now this chart, let me see if I can point at it. Okay, this is the HF spectrum here, okay? Now, this is 30 megahertz. This is 300 megahertz. The standard is the strictest between 30 and 300 megahertz. Then it goes back up, not all the way. This is the uncontrolled environment standard for the general public, this lower thing, 0.2 milliwatts 
per square centimeter. This is one milliwatt. <clears throat> and remember that one milliwatt. That's the occupational standard. Point two is the general public. And uh, so those are the numbers. Now let's do a couple more measurements. What about some, you can't really see it. There's a step IR urban beam by this guy's pool. And so we went out, this guy volunteered. I went out recently and measured <clears throat> with my Rayham meter. And he, he runs a kilowatt and he's got this urban beam, which covers, oh, I think it covers 40 meters through six meters. And it's 30 feet up and right by the pool. Over here, across the pool, the field is safely below the standard. It is not a hazard. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Now, this is a ham uh, who, he's a well-known DXer, I'll name him Arnie, in 6 hc in 6 Hotel, California. <clears throat> he's been the closest to, oh my gosh, um, uh, in the in the South Atlantic, I, I'm dropping the name Bouvet. Bouvet. He's been the closest to Bouvet of any ham in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, they they got all the way. Their group got all the way down there, within sight of Bouvet Island. Weather was so bad the helicopters couldn't fly <clears throat> to deliver the stations to the island. And then one of the engines on the boat blew up and they retreated to South Africa uh, to safety. Uh, anyway, this is that guy, N6HC Arnie, out in front of his house, I'm on the sidewalk, fields are very weak. He's running a kilowatt back here. Fields are very weak out on the street, not a problem. <clears throat> now, one thing I wanna show you uh, as I try to wrap this up, uh, this is, my house as it appeared some years ago. And this is my antenna all the way, it's a 70 foot tower, but it's all the way down to 25 feet. Okay, it's a three element tribander pointed at the street because that's a direction I work a lot. That's pointed east. Okay, so what's the, what are the RF fields like out on the street? Okay, so I, I run a kilowatt on 10 meters, put a rubber, rubber band around the mic, and I go out to the street and measure. And let me just show you, show you what happens. And you can read the meter. On the street, now this is an uncontrolled environment. It's the strictest standard. And this thing, and I trust this, this is an accurate meeting, meter, and it's getting an accurate reading. It's like one milliwatt per square centimeter. That's five times the controlled, I'm sorry, the uncontrolled standard out on the sidewalk. <clears throat> and this illustrates something. If you do the computer program and put in the numbers for that antenna, the frequency, how far it is from this sidewalk, how much power, all of that, you're gonna, it's going to say your field should be about 0.2 milliwatts, not, I'm sorry, 0 0.02 milliwatts, not 0 0.1. This is, this is way over the standard. And what's my point? My point is that in the near field of an antenna, you're gonna have hot spots. The calculated numbers from a computer program or from a chart or a table <clears throat> I, they're going to give you a general ballpark, but if you go out and measure, there are going to be surprises. You probe around, you look, and here's a hot spot out in front of my house. It's way above the standard. Now, if you do the averaging and you don't transmit key down all the time, it's actually not that bad. But I was doing a key down test. And this is what I got. So what I'm saying is be aware that um, uh, if you measure, you're going to see results in some places that involve reflection. There will be sometimes 
when you see a field that you don't expect. That's just inevitable. Now, I'm going to do a sample. Now, this is, uh, this is just one calculation. It's in my PowerPoint show. I can do a real, I think I can do a real time calculation on my screen when I finish here in a minute. But this one, this one is a canned uh, pre-done calculation. What am I measuring? A couple of months ago, I had an article in QST about an electric car with microwave and VHF ham gear in it. And one of the pictures in the QST article had this. It was a station that goes from six meters through 10 gigahertz. And the, the main antenna, I mean, there's a rubber duck for 6.2 and 4.32. But for 900 up, there's this most amazing antenna. It's called a Vivaldi. It covers from 850 megahertz to 12 gigahertz. That includes six amateur bands, right? <clears throat> that thing has 11 dB gain across a range of an octave. Is that a, no, it's more than an octave. Anyway, 800 megahertz to 12 gigahertz. That is one very good antenna, but it's on the passenger seat. Am I zapping myself? Well, let's find out. We'll do the calculation. Okay, the worst, I'm gonna do the worst case, which I know from past experiments and measurements, it's gonna be the 2304 gigahertz, 2304, sorry, 2.3 gigahertz, 2304 megahertz band. That's where you're gonna see the highest exposures. So power at the antenna, 18 watts, okay? Now let's go through some more. 18 watts at the antenna. Now you got to decide what percent of the time do you transmit? Because the exposure is averaged over six minutes in controlled environment, over 30 minutes in an uncontrolled environment, places accessible to others. So what percent of the time do you transmit? Do you transmit key down for half an hour? Oh, probably not. So I entered 50%. Transmit 50% of the time, listen 50%. So here's that number. Now, the FCC standard also, also says, look at the duty cycle. If you're on key down FM, it's a 100% duty cycle. There are digital modes that while you're transmitting, it's key down. What about CW and SSB? Well, they're intermittent. The waveform on SSB uh, could have you transmitting as little as 20% of the time on average, the duty cycle. Okay, so what's my duty cycle? I'm on sideband mostly, so I say 40%. Now, what's the antenna gain in DVI? Okay, this thing, this, this Vivaldi antenna has 11 DVI gain. So I, and that's almost, almost flat across from 800 megahertz to 12 gigahertz. So I put in 11. What's the distance to the area of interest from the center of the antenna? And I put, well, four feet. Could somebody get closer to four feet? They could lean against the car, yeah, but I'd be yelling at them. So I figure four feet is a fair guesstimate. Okay, what's the frequency in megahertz? 2304. Now, do you wish to include ground reflection? And there's an explanation here. The EPA sponsored this part uh, and they think it's important. So do you wanna include ground effects? That's where you get reflection. I said, yes. Okay, what, what are our results? Okay, this screen tells you the results. And the, the, up at the top, it's covered but a time and date stamps the, uh, uh, the reading. So if you do a hard copy, which you can, it says hard copy, yes or no. I didn't, I don't think I showed you that, but there's a place where you can say you, you want a hard copy. <laughs> anyway, it puts the date and time that you did this assessment. This is what a routine evaluation looks like. 
This is all you have to do. You do it for each band and you do it for each antenna you're using and each distance at which you are concerned about people being present. And what does it say? At three feet, the power density is 1.1 milliwatts. Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, in a controlled environment, the standard is five milliwatts. This installation meets the control standard at a distance of 1.4 feet and the uncontrolled standard at 3.2 feet. And this thing isn't very dangerous. And of course, the driver is off the back of the antenna and there are deep nulls off the back. So I do not worry about using that in the driver's seat. Somebody outside the main, bo main beam, uh, that's where the concern would be. And if somebody's leaning against the car when I have to transmit, I'm going to ask them to step back. Now you can also calculate outside the main beam, the main lobe, and this explains how to do that. All right, folks, I've quickly run through all of this. <clears throat> Let me just stop at this point, uh, give you a couple of references. You can Google, if you Google OET65B.pdf, you're going to get FCC Bulletin 65, Supplement B, which is about ham radio routine evaluation. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you do that, uh, this whole booklet comes up on your screen, you can print it out. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the other side, the site is the field. This is their website. My website has an article about RF safety. It also has the computer program that I wrote that the FCC approved. Uh, it has it both as a basic program and a compiled program, an EXE file that you can download and run directly. Now, the leading uh, third party uh, online calculator, and this is linked on the AWRL website as well. It's right there in your neighborhood, <coughs> Lake Washington Ham Club. And you don't need to write this down, you're gonna remember it. Lake Washington Ham Club is one word, dot org. That takes you to their home, home page. Then you go to resources and ARF exposure calculator. They've got a very good online calculator. Okay, folks, I'm basically done. I'm not sure how with a Zoom talk to take questions. So I'm gonna minimize this if I can figure out how. Yeah, and Wayne, thank, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up here for questions. And uh, if anybody's got anything, go ahead and fire it away. If you want, you can also post in the chat and I'll read the question, but anybody have questions for Wayne? I've got a question. Go ahead. So did, have any of the handheld manufacturers run these calculations for their their devices since they know exactly what the antenna is and perhaps can assume that they're they're being held close to the head yeah they have all the information able to run these calculations oh of course they do yeah i don't i haven't been inside any manufacturer's facility including balfang i mean balfang is unique because they have these very inexpensive HD. They know full well what they're doing. And, you know, and if, if you read the fine print, most of their manuals say, hold it away from your head. And see, the, the reason I'm not that worried about HT is because uh, they're fairly low power. The antennas, fortunately, are not very efficient. And uh, uh, the fields are not that huge from handhelds especially if you hold it away from your head. Um, so I'm not that worried about HTs. And yes, they are aware of, the, the bigger problem is cell phones because people hold those right against their ears. And those have been shown to cause much stronger exposures than, than a ham HT. And there are 5 billion cell phones. 
to me, that's where the problem lies. Do the HT manufacturers publish their data? I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. You know, they. I know Yesu has a whole section with warnings in their manuals. I've seen it, but I'm not sure how specific it is. Thank you. What about Wi-Fi? Uh, we're exposed to Wi-Fi continuously all day in our homes, for those of us who have it, at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, I think. What does that do? Well, I've measured around my house, and we have Wi-Fi. And generally, the fields are so weak uh, that they barely register on the meter. Uh, I mean, yeah. I spoke around those four meters I showed you back at the beginning, I mean, this, this is a good place to end, is to go back and show those meters again. Because those meters, uh, I mean, they're not very expensive. You can get one that's accurate in the Wi-Fi range, like 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. You can get one of those for a very modest price. And you can poke around your house for peace of mind. I don't think that's a big problem. I, I, I tell you where I think a big problem is, Thanks. a kilowatt uh, with a dipole in the attic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, again, the inverse, the, the inverse square thing, uh, you know, the thing that I illustrated with Tony West stepping away from my 19 inch whip and sitting down, she reduced her exposure fourfold by just stepping away and sitting down. Um, distance is your friend. Any other questions? Uh, Wayne, this is Sam in 7 RHE. I have a, a thing from about, an example from about 20 years ago. I've been curious about being formerly in the RF power industry in college. Uh, it's a 60 hertz EMF pro, pro, problem, and we know 60 hertz is not ionizing. But 20 years ago in my area, there was a power line about mm, 60 feet, let's say 50 feet tall, 130 kV, and people lived 200 feet from it. The power company proposed uh, putting in 100 foot towers and 230 kV, and everybody went into a major overload panic. And I sat there and I said to myself, well, we're doubling, doubling the voltage, so that doubles the, the EMF, but we're more than doubling the height for, by the inverse square law. So they're actually getting less, less exposure at 230 kV than they were in the previous line at 138. Is that correct? Well, they have yeah, the physics is correct, of course. Um, but now whether that, uh, I, I, I did, I, it's not in this slideshow. I have another slideshow that is primarily 60 hertz. Um, and I went out and measured with a milligauss meter. Uh, and high tension lines for two or 300 feet do put out a field uh, in the order of three to five milligauss. Now, that's not a lot, but it's over the threshold. Uh, well, uh, the, the woman, Eleanor Adair, who did the original research about power configurations in childhood leukemia. She was saying that kids who lived in a three to five milligauss field had a higher than normal rate of childhood leukemia. Uh, she won the Darsonville Award for discovering that. Um, yeah, and I would not want to raise kids uh, 200 feet from a high tension line because you're going to see the ones I've measured, you're going to see three, four, five milligauss. And if you stand right underneath the thing, you're going to see 30 or 40 milligauss. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in that kind of a field. Not for long. Thank you. I any, have, any other questions for Wayne? Jason, okay. I have a question. It's Harlan WB7HF. Thanks, Wayne. This has been invaluable, by the way. Um, I, I've got a magnetic loop antenna on the roof of my condo and I'm, uh, it's over my living room and I'm uh, under the roof, only about six feet away under the mag loop. I'm 
wondering if the calculations run on this, um, this test calculations are also um, related to mag loop. I assume they are since it's RF energy, maybe a different form. Yeah, well, uh, the mag loop has a different pattern. Uh, the problem uh, with any of these programs is you've got to enter a gain. And, you know, you've got to figure out uh, what the gain is in a given direction from the mag loop, if you're going to do it that way. The other way to do it that I would trust more, because a mag loop, um, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a Yagi antenna. Uh, it's 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 a different breed of cat, um, and I would feel more comfortable measuring it. Uh, you know, I would borrow one of these meters and go poke around, and I would want to see what I found. But if you, if you do it by uh, the formula, the calculations, you'll get a number. Um, but and the the number is based on your assumption of what the gain is. Understand. Thank you very much. I'll just get one of those meters and do it accurately then? Well, I trust the meters, especially uh, the one that I, that I have on, on the bottom here. This, this is a professional meter. Uh, this was widely used over many years in industry, universities, uh, where, where they needed accurate numbers. Uh, these others are lower cost. They're not as accurate as the, the Rayham meter, but they're pretty accurate they'll certainly give you a ballpark. I mean, and the ballpark with your mag loop, what's it gonna be? Either the field is very weak, it's not a problem, don't lose sleep, don't lose sleep over it, or maybe there is a problem. You measure and find out. And if there is, you have to move the thing. Yes. <laughs> Wayne, I have a question. Yeah. Art KF7GD. So how often does the RA ham need to be calibrated? And I, I found one on eBay, but it doesn't include the probe, oh, which I assume is very important. And not only is it crucial, but there are two or three different models. Uh, I, have a, I have a 484, uh, which is uh, the model 4 meter and the model 84C probe, I think. Don't quote me. I'd have to look it up. But I think that's the model I have, and they're all different. And the meter and the probe have to be matched. So if you get somebody who has a surplus meter and a surplus probe, don't assume they, they belonged together. Uh, the first one I bought, I made that mistake. I wasted a couple hundred dollars. I wanted, I had to have a Rayham meter. I had used one at, at Cal State Fullerton. I trusted it. Somebody was selling one and I bought it and it was, a mismatched pair. I mean, the meeting, the readings were all crazy. And so I just, I ended up just putting it in the box. I wasted my money. Then I went shopping more judiciously and I found a matched pair, which I trust and am now using a lot. Calibrating it. Yeah, you're supposed to calibrate it every year. Do I pay to calibrate it that often? Well, no, not quite. Um, but I trust it. It's consistent enough with the others that uh, I think it's within the ballpark. Did so, you have a list anywhere that um, tells people how to identify that match that you're talking about? What, we, what numbers and stuff we can look for? Yeah, you have to search. You have to do a Google on the Rayham meter. Uh, somebody has online the manual uh, for the model I bought. Uh, and I think it's as I recall, it's 484 with a four uh, meter and an 84C probe. Uh, the probe is, is three dimensional. It's a three axis probe. Um, and you know, you've got to match them. Uh, and uh, I think depending on what model you find on eBay, uh, I, I, think, I think you have to, you have to just search uh, with Google to figure out what, to, what you're buying. Okay, thank you. Yep. All okay. right. Hey, Wayne, we appreciate your time. Let's see if we one last question and then we'll uh, continue on. We'll do our break and, and move on to club business. So any, uh, any last question for, for Wayne? Okay, folks, thank you very much.
Wayne, thank you. This was great. Uh, appreciate your time. Take care. Thank okay. You. And I have, thank you. I have to turn on. Yeah, you can stop sharing. I think it's uh, so, folks. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and let's see. I've got eleven fifteen by my clock. Almost eleven sixteen. Why don't we come back together at? We'll take a five minute break. Come back together at let's say eleven twenty one, and we'll uh, we'll start club business. Thanks, everyone. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>